Welcome everyone. Um, I hope everybody had their coffee and having a great morning already. I cordially welcome all of you on behalf of Sure Network so, and Delta Metropolis uh, Association. Right. Um, I'm Alankrita Sarkar, Spatial Planner and Project Leader from Delta Metropolis Association, and I'll be moderating the session for next one and a half hours. Uh, this is the third edition of Next Generation Podium, which is hosted by the Consortia of Sean Network. Uh, uh, maybe the Consortia can say hi already here, but special thanks to City of Amsterdam, City of The Hague, Province of South Holland, Matrix, and my co-facilitator, Cecilia Brown. Uh, everybody will be here now in the closing ceremony, but over the two days during the workshop as well. So heads for a shout out to all the students please ask a lot of questions raise your hand be a part of the discussion drop lots of questions in the chat box and interact and learn more from these experts who are joining uh for those who are joining for the first time um this is an initiative with uh, the goal of providing the next generation or the young generation of designers and planners with a podium where they can uh, investigate and uh, present their own ideas, strategies, visions on how to strengthen the mega region of Euro Delta. As I mentioned, this is the third edition. So we have been doing this on, from 2021 and 2022. And this year, we already did the lunch forums in March as a part of New York Water Week, as well as we hosted five open offices. So I may a bit curious have any of you heard of next generation podium before or is this your first event um how is it should we do a quick poll maybe just a quickly how far you know next generation podium that will really give us an idea how much deeper to go in this opening ceremony about it or shall we just go deeper into the themes Is everybody able to see it? I see some reactions coming in. Okay, so a lot of first timers, more than 50%. Some of you joined last event, some of you know a little bit more. Um, I would like to call upon stage already uh, Cecilia Brown while I start sharing the program of the day because she is also the uh, facilitator of uh, uh, Next Generation Podium together with Delta Metropole. Uh, and uh, quickly I share my screen to show the program of the day and then we go more deeper into it. Yes, is it visible for everyone? Perfect. So this is the opening ceremony. We have a whole two day program and now the opening ceremony is the public program, which is from nine to 10.30 with uh, mainly two keynote speakers whom I will be um, introducing a bit later. Um, and after this opening ceremony, the students will go deeper into the um, project, start working in smaller groups in different phases of the project, and uh, we'll be receiving a closing statement by Eric Passwears uh, at the end of the day. And tomorrow, again, they will continue till um, two o'clock in the afternoon with their own workshop. And at two o'clock, we start with the closing ceremony, which is under public program. And we will introduce more tomorrow, but quickly just as an overview uh, this is this is the group of jury who will be looking into your pitches and discussing reflecting on your work tomorrow um, i'm not sure if my uh, you could see the program completely uh, because i realized that there might be a pop up coming up but um, i hope it's clear and there are different steps that the next generation workshop will take place and uh, going deeper into which includes a contextualization, ideation phase, design, upscaling, and impact. 
but we go deeper more into that. This year, the idea of uh, the aim of Next Generation Podium is to um, create a spatial action plan from the local scale to mega region scale. What does that mean? We go deeper, but we, need, we learn a lot in this morning session from our speakers. Uh, Cecilia, uh, can I have you on the screen? Spotlight, yes. Perfect. So we, ha we have been working together since uh, 2020 on the roadmap. Actually, we started working together with the roadmap of Euro Delta together with Sure Network, and we started creating some kind of strategy and overview for upcoming decade. But meanwhile, we spoke another in another event, which was more about the importance of mega region, where Eric Pasvier suggested that why don't we include young minds and why don't we include a new thinking in the discussion and get more um, cross-border exchange in the Euro Delta. On that note, we started Next Generation Podium. Cecilia Brown here is joining from Germany, the metropolitan region of Cologne, and she's a German facilitator for Next Generation Podium. At the same time, she's also the director of EGTC Rhine Alpine Corridor. She has been working since quite long time on Eurodelta. Maybe Cecilia, you can quickly tell a little bit about you and then we go into the discussion. Yes, hello, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. So I think, I hope you can hear me and the connection is stable enough. But um, let's repeat, I mean, it's, it's true that we have been working together for three years on, on this idea of the Eurodelta. I come from the region of Germany and I was working for the metropolitan region in Germany working closely with other regions on the idea of setting up a closer network and a better integration in this Northwestern European scale. And uh, this has brought me some lessons in the past years. And I think it's uh, important to remain be having these very close bonds. And it's important to do this, not only from a bottom up local and regional level, but also creating the importance from a top down level and creating also a better understanding of what the Euro Delta is. So I was fascinated to see that almost half of the people don't know what this concept really is. So it's a great already tool and a great learning lesson to be working on this scale for you in the next two days and to get to know what it means to upscale ideas. And I think this is something that we in practice, Alan Krita and I and all the other consortia members too have been practicing advocately and very uh, in, in concentratedly over the past three years. And I'm doing this also now with my three different jobs that I have on multiple scales. So this really is something that you, you have to yeah, learn over time and work yourself into, but coming from a regional scale of a big metropolitan region that has helped to break open this cross-border collaboration um, idea in the Euro Delta. So this is my path for, for now, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. And Maybe just, uh, I completely agree with you as a spatial planner myself, I think uh, the challenges of cross-border motivates me every day to get more deeper and deeper into the planning and design of it. Uh, but also including the young generation in the discussion has been a complete different experience for us to how to do it, what are the right questions, how we can use the maximum potential. So how was your experience working with the young generation? Uh, yeah, I, last, I, years. last years, yeah, I think I felt very personally um, connected to this because I was missing this scale in my studies. I studied urban studies in four different cities and I was missing really the interconnection and the, the linkages between the cities and also upscaling the ideas that we have developed on a local scale. So I was really missing this kind of format. And I think it's important for the students to get in touch with it because if you look into policies if you look into future jobs into where you want to head from after your studies this is the reality if you want to go in the direction of a bigger scale this is a good uh, tool for you to get there and I think working with the students has has taught me a lot in the past years because we've created a huge network with universities cross-border and of course from a practitioner's point of view as well but of course the students and the researchers that's something that is already ongoing but the the whole idea is to connect it better and to integrate it better into the actual space and spatially make it make it uh, to be seen. And I think this is a good stepping stone to get there with the yeah. format. I, I agree. And, and 
do you see this continuing in the upcoming years and uh, what else can we add to this format? We have been doing this as a five-day symposium last two years. This year, we broke it down in two parts. But this online conference, does it work for you? Or do you think there are some gaps or some challenges or something new that we could try in the upcoming years? Well, I surely hope so that this continues because it's uh, it's been an investment so far already in this direction. I mean, it's our third run and our, our third episode, so to say. So I really hope we can also create one of these forums or one of these podiums in a real podium, in a real with a real audience and face to face. I think that would be a great improvement and it's very important to meet each other also. Of course, I also like this idea of keeping a hybrid conference and having also people joining now from uh, Italy and sometimes the questions is being raised yeah but Italy is that the Euro Delta and frankly I would say yes because yes. Delta is not just only a, um, a river basin and a connected area with rivers yes it is but it's also a system and we're looking into system thinking and connecting through corridors and I work on one of the biggest corridors from Rotterdam to Genova so this is already connecting Italy into it, but it's all about, you know, looking at the map and understanding, okay, we're actually not so far from each other and there are many, many connections and we have to highlight them, bring them to a, um, a bigger a bigger audience and then also find the linkages and there are plenty. Now, thank you so much, Cecilia. This was a good overview of the Delta region connects from Rotterdam to Genoa, what you mentioned. And we yes, we have a lot of audience from Italy. On that note, I would like to invite Dagmar Kim. Uh, she is representing Sure Network, and we have been discussing Sure Network so much uh, till now. Uh, she will help us understanding a bit more deeper into it. Um, so Dagmar Kim, she is the International Project Manager in the Department of Space and Sustainability from City of Amsterdam, as well as Secretariat of the Sure Network. So. Dagmar, how can you help us understanding your network more? Yeah, thank you very much. So, well, first of all, I want to thank you that you invited me to talk here. And I'm very happy that this event is happening right now. We've been working a long time on it and we're happy that we make it work every year. Um, I work for the city of Amsterdam, uh, so I'm a civic servant. And as you can imagine, very often I also get to question why is the city of Amsterdam working uh, on the scale of the Euro Delta? And I hope I can uh, help explaining uh, this a little bit in a presentation I prepared. Um, I'm not so familiar with Zoom, so I hope it will work um, right now. So can you see the full screen right now? Uh, no, we see the other screen. Not the you had the same problem a second ago. Maybe now? Can yeah, you see? Now yeah? it's good. Now it's good. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, the Euro Delta. I will tell you a little bit about the, what is the Euro Delta. And as Cecilia was saying, it is a vague concept and we're trying, still trying to understand what it is. So, I'm going to take you along on a journey that we've started three years ago, uh, telling you a little bit about the, how we see it. Well, when you look, I, I start always, with, I like to start with this map because this is a picture of Europe at night when you look down from the from a satellite and you see, if you look in the middle of the screen, you see this light spots here. What is happening here? I think what happens here is that nature and culture meet. This is a place where we have a delta. A delta, and this is a map of all the waterways of Europe. And there you can see in the left corner, you can see this ex extremely busy area with waterways. And this is also, here to zoom in, you see all the cities are actually connected by the water. And we have many, many harbors in this region. And these harbors are very important. They are the fundament, basically, to Euro Delta and the water. I think this is important. And so what Euro Delta also says already, it's about a Delta. And the data and this water was also the base for a very rich culture. With this are actually pictures, if you look at it, if you don't know, on the left corner, you, you see Brussels. On the right, then Hague, there are pictures of Amsterdam in the left 
There are pictures of uh, Ghent, Antwerp, all different cities in the Sierra Delta. And the cities and this richness attracted people. And we've been growing and growing as a Euro Delta for a couple of years. You can see green and city are fluidly going over each other. In green areas, you see infrastructure cutting through. And it became a home to 41 million people. These are four pictures of four different cities in the Euro Delta, big cities. You can hardly see the difference because we are sharing our culture. And in this area, we work and live together. These people live here. This is a picture of, the, of people pendling every day from Holland to Germany, from Germany to Holland, from Belgium, Luxembourg, France. There are thousands of people using this area. And that makes no sense to have any borders in, within these areas. This is actually a situation at the Dutch, uh, Dutch um, German border where a street is divided by a border. But when we, then we got, comes the question, of course, if you see these pictures, you can raise the question, could you call it a mega city? Well, what is a mega city? Well, when you look into mega cities, it's a city is about 10 million people. And if you look at the development of cities, this is a map, you see that since 1950 up to 2015, and projected to 23rd, the amount of megacities will rise immensely. And you can see that many of these megacities are actually in Asia, situated in Asia. And in Europe, you see a couple of megacities rising, still not that big, but you see a lot, a lot of little spots from a medium city, larger city and smaller city. But we also think, when you look at about, think about mega cities, you also think about the problems. You think about slums, you think, think about garbage, you think about air pollutioning. You have the picture of just people from Tokyo with, ma 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 with masks, even a long time before Corona. You think about all the people living there. But, you, but there's also one thing next to this, all this negative impact is that they are producing a lot of money. There, uh, that's where the most GDP is generated right now. The income of the mega cities in 2030 will be enormous. The projection that is that in 2030, the 600 biggest cities of the world will generate 60% of the GDP, which means that mega city will become more and more important. And they have an enormous, and we call that an agglomeration benefit because you have many people, many knowledge, many things. You can upscale new ideas very easily. And so, so in Europe, we developed that concept of macro regions. It's a little bit theoretical, but macro regions could be, as the OECD states, the European sustainable alternative to this mega city. Macro regions that are cities that are connected with each other, cities that work together. And this is what we are trying to do in the Euro Delta. But at the same time, we see that the balance in our area is endangered. You all know that we're facing a climate crisis. I don't have to tell you that. You probably all have problems finding affordable housing. Uh, you all have, uh, you're all that work, living, living or studying at least at the cities. We have uh, many crises right now. So we as a cities come together and we try to, as cities and NGOs and research institutes, we came together and have formed an informal network. We are nothing really official. We are not, we don't have, we are not elected. We are not an organization. We are just the people, uh, institutes that think that if we work together and we stop thinking with in borders, and if we focus on the challenges, maybe we can help to restore the balance of the Euro Delta. And we restore the balance by the transition to, for example, a circular economy to become so sustainable and to become an equitable Delta. Well, this is a little bit my, uh, my, uh, my introduction from the other side of the Shiva Secretariat to tell you a little bit why we are so happy that you came here with us the next two days and help us to come to find new innovative ideas for cross-border cooperation in the Euro Delta. And of course, I also want to thank everybody, Alan Krita and Cecilia especially, but also all the other people that make it 
happen to make this workshop happen the next two days. And uh, well, I hope you're gonna enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dagmar. I am. Uh, it's really great overview that you uh, presented, and I just want to point out to all the audience, please. Uh, listen to the word voluntary all the cities are trying to work voluntary this is not a legalized organization the reason behind that is the spatial planners and designers we think that this is we can make it more impactful if we work together crossing the borders and that's the task for you today and tomorrow so keep that mindset in uh, in place that uh, we have to make more initiatives from local scale, not thinking about the, just the geographic borders or the administrative borders there. Um, but as I mentioned before, we have already gone a bit more deeper in March during the lunch forums, where we discussed about circular delta, accessible delta, and fluid delta, the three themes for this year. Uh, I'm curious a little bit if you all joined, but if you didn't join, as a next speaker, I would like to include, introduce Paul Gerritsen, Director of Delta Metropolis Association and a very, very strong EuroDelta enthusiast uh, to tell us briefly about the lunch forums that we had in March and um, tell us what are your takeaways? What did you learn? Or is there any tips and tricks for the students that they can get inspired from? Yes, thank you very much, Alankita. Indeed, it's very nice and very helpful together to kick off the third edition of the Next Generation Podium. I'm really looking forward also to the results uh, coming already quite quickly tomorrow afternoon. Uh, I'll be also joining that last part uh, of the presentation and, and the jury reflecting on, on the work. Um, so very excited that, that we could do this. And indeed, we have a little bit of a different kind of setup where the online lunch forums have been already uh, before, but uh, don't worry about it if you missed that um, in, in March. Um, they're all available. I think the link has already been shared. Uh, and indeed, the same three topics, circular delta, accessible delta, and fluid delta, have been uh, looked through the lens um, of uh, different experts. So it was very interesting to have that first-hand experience with these kind of uh, topics, broad topics, large topics that are very hard to track uh, most of the time. So uh, it's good to get their insights on board. So I'll, if you didn't uh, watch them yet, maybe you can do that uh, this, uh, this evening when you have some time to, to look into it. Um, they're all available, as said. Um, by the way, I, I, I noticed that not all links are working, but the, the main, the first link of all uh, lectures will work. So you, if you, if you try a little bit harder, you will see you can find everything on uh, online in on YouTube. Um, and maybe to 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 give some takeaways from uh, from the three lectures. Um, so the first one we started uh, uh, on the theme of uh, circular delta um, with uh, first an introduction actually by Eric Pasphere, uh, who will also join later, uh, well, you will see. Um, also addressing this uh, importance of, of, uh, of uh, finding out whether this um, circular economy is actually really uh, belonging to what scale level. And his idea, and I think some of the speakers also um, gave notice to that, is that actually on the Euro Delta level of scale, uh, it's really important and interesting to look at how to create a different type of economy, uh, not uh, one of a linear sort that only takes away materials, but one which reuses materials. And um, we had a very uh, interesting first talk by uh, Peter van Asje, who talked about his experience as an architect uh, in becoming circular uh, with his office uh, Bureau Sla. And I think um, his experience also showed that to, to get that hands-on hands experience is really important. So he really uh, tried to create new building materials out of um, uh, used plastics um, and, and make, make new products out of them that not only are uh, sustainable, but also look good, eh? are also real architecture. How can you create quality architecture with um, new types of uh, materials that are actually 
rest products of, uh, of other processes. And he managed uh, a couple of years ago uh, with a pavilion at the uh, Dutch um, Design Week to show that it really can be done. A project which is completely reusable, which is completely made of circular materials, but also reusable and can be taken uh, apart again uh, and, and, uh, and used somewhere else. Marcus Stempler was next uh, of the Derek's group, who uh, actually is, is a company who focuses on, uh, on creating um, um, uh, buildings out of uh, structural wood uh, systems. And uh, he came himself from um, actually a company which was focused on first on construction of uh, iron uh, structures. And uh, he explained how actually it is really a, a completely different world if you work with wood and the idea of wood being, of course, that it can not only be grown um, uh, and, and, and in that sense be made again, but also uh, be reused uh, constantly if you take note of that uh, in terms of how your construction is uh, being put together. And he uh, talked about the enormous uptick of the amount of uh, uh, timber constructions that are being created again um, in the Euro Delta, of course, there's differences in cultures of, uh, of uh, building uh, sorts. And that's also very interesting to see that actually, particularly in the Netherlands, actually, we've gone away from construction in wood and we have to regain this knowledge again. And uh, from, from the German perspective, this is much more ingrained in the, in the, uh, in the, in the building uh, uh, construction as it is still, so we can help each other there. Stefan Kampelman, uh, last one, which was uh, introducing uh, his personal experience again with how to um, use wood in, uh, in architecture, but his personal experience in the sense that he really wanted to analyze the flow of wood in the, in the urban setting and looking at the Brussels uh, example, where actually there's quite a lot of wood around Brussels, which also needs to be maintained. And, that actually this wood, which um, is then coming out of the forest, um, can be very much used uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in building projects in the city itself. And of course, he subsequently, after his analysis of the flow of wood, also created a company which really focuses on using wood from the surrounding in, uh, in the city itself. So, that's actually very interesting in terms of hands-on experience. I think that was for me the most uh, enlightening that you can really see this change happening. And that's much different from the second topic, which was focusing about accessible Delta. And of course, accessibility and, and, uh, and dealing with that has been a long time struggle, particularly for, uh, for, the, uh, for the area that we're talking about. And there's a lot of people uh, living in the, in the Euro Delta, but they also live quite dispersed moving from all sides to all sides. And through that, at the same time, there's also all kinds of different skills coming. So there's also the big goods transport, freight transport that goes uh, in, to, the, to the rest of Europe from this Euro Delta, from all the ports that are there um, is, um, well, it's already mentioned, it's, um, it's, it's quite a challenge to, uh, to make that whole intensive mobility system also sustainable. Yeah? So to create a different type of mobility system that, uh, that can be made sustainable. It's connected to all kinds of international European agreements. And it's really a, a, a very difficult, hard to crack um, and, and not to crack. Uh, and it's uh, becoming a serious problem. Yeah? So it's not only in terms of nuisance and, and, uh, and uh, emissions, of course, but also direct health consequences in, in many of our cities is really uh, quite a challenge. So we had also um, three um, um, very interesting uh, insights in there. First off from uh, Cecilia Brown, who you have already seen, introducing uh, the Rhine Alpine corridor. So really this large scale structure that's, um, that goes across all of Europe and that's so uh, important uh, in terms of uh, the, the way it's a lifeline for many of the uh, of the hinterlands and 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 the way how they are operating uh, also economically. 
Um, and of course, that touches upon um, uh, also where it uh, touches the, the cities that lie within this, uh, this, this corridor. Luke Woolens uh, presented the results of a, um, a research which was initiated by the Shuri or Delta Stice research, a Stice report. He um, focused on um, uh, to focus on how to directly uh, reduce emissions uh, by mobility uh, in the Euro that what which which things are most uh, effective in that and this answer was uh, was fourfold zero emission zones uh, the potential of uh, of mobility as a service um, and the shift from air to rail and cross much better cross border uh, rail connections uh, so with all of these four topics he brought forward quite a clear roadmap which is quite quite well achievable but really requires this action on the level of the euro delta and this is the, the difficulty to to create so we have possibilities of really creating a difference but how to then get it going uh, from QNET, um, also uh, from the uh, uh, also showed give an insight into that of getting all of the different authorities on the same page. Um, it's it's really quite a difficult way to do. But one of the things he uh, introduced to us was to really start with uh, creating pilot projects, and that I think is also quite interesting challenge for us. Can we create pilot projects which show that the things can be done differently, and that we can uh, move forward in. Um, uh, in, in making our mobility system uh, more sustainable. Um, the last one, um, third forum, uh, was on water, on water management, fluid delta, obviously uh, quite an um, important project for a delta, uh, as you can imagine. It was also very fitting since, of course, this whole series of lectures was part of the New York Water Week at the same period, um, which was uh, really interesting to have this interaction going on. It started out with a conversation uh, with Yvonne Havinga of uh, the Benelux. Uh, of course, the Benelux is a very historic alliance in this Euro Delta, but can it take a new role? And particularly when focusing on the, on the issues of uh, water management, which um, a couple of years ago showed so vividly how it's important to really manage water cross-border. Carola Hein, uh, Professor of Urban History at, uh, at the University of Delft, representing Leiden Delft Erasmus University cooperation in the, in the program of the Port City Future, uh, then showed us uh, how you can actually um, design with water, uh, the importance of designing with water, um, and, uh, and of course, the very important point of also making uh, clear how um, much of our territory, the urban structure of our territory has been formed based on water and all infrastructures that came from that. The way we live has always been in a kind of interaction with water. And that kind of a notion of taking that uh, interaction of living with the water forward is, uh, is very vivid in her presentation. Uh, Anna de Canera uh, from, uh, from the, the Brussels Baumeister's office also showed us uh, similarly, uh, looking into uh, the, uh, the Brussels um, uh, situation, how the impact of water and living in the city uh, becomes very important nowadays with climate change. So she showed us how actually we've over-engineered our water system, we've engineered the problems out of our sight uh, for a large part, and then we are shocked to notice that uh, suddenly um, this kind of systems can fail due to the impact of climate change. And we need to re-establish our relationship with water in the, within the city that can bring forward also quality in the city. And that kind of re-establishment of our relationship with water in transforming our existing cities is key to bringing forward our systems to uh, our cities to the future. Um, last up was uh, Annabelle Houdin. Uh, together with uh, Jack O'Connor from the Bond Water Work, uh, Network, and they showed us basically how important it is to uh, connect the different stories, uh, but also connect the different organizations that have to deal with water and water management and position it also internationally. 
Um, Jack O'Connor showed us his experience in Southeast Asia. So it's very interesting to compare deltas um, uh, internationally. There's also quite a lot of relationship from the UR delta from different organizations, so from Water World Network, but also from, from, from the Netherlands and elsewhere that have connections with um, urbanized deltas in, in other parts of the world. And we struggle with same kind of situations. Uh, but of course, coming from a very different type of uh, position, uh, and that kind of relationship is actually quite inspiring. And he showed us how actually society and the territories uh, can be reconnected uh, in, in what he called the social ecological system. So this idea of the social ecological systems that deals with this delta territory is actually something which is very inspiring, I think, coming out of Southeast Asia context uh, and, and can be reestablished here uh, in the Netherlands. So these were my takeaways, sort of a small introduction to what, what has been said. Uh, I thought it was very um, inspiring to see firsthand uh, experiences also of designers uh, being uh, wanting to change their way of working and the, also the importance of that and what can uh, bring, uh, uh, what can come out of that and what can, can uh, bring forward your way of looking at uh, these topics yourself. So perhaps um, that's enough for now. Thank uh, you so please, much. Uh, please see them online uh, as well. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. This was really, you covered everything. Uh, that's perfect for the students to revise if they have already joined. And for the students, please remember and use these tips and ideas while you're working on the project later today. Um, important learning for me from what Paul suggested, we can foresee change, change in the behavior of people, change in the behavior of the practitioners, change in the mindset of working in collaborations, cross border. So innovate as much as possible, everyone try to be, try to, let's try to bring the change together. On that note, our first keynote speaker today, thank you so much, Paul. I would like to uh, get on screen Evo Cray. Let me see. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, Thank you so much, Ivo, for joining. Uh, Ivo Cray is the first keynote speaker from Polis Network. He's the director of policy and projects at Polis Network. Uh, Polis Network is a network of cities and regions for innovation in urban mobility, which is one of our themes that we will be covering. Um, Ivo is very active in the EU European research and innovation projects and advocating the relations between TNT, SAMP, public transport, access regulations and digitalizations of these aspects. And uh, along with uh, Polis Network, his previous experiences are also very relevant for us, how he has worked with Eurocities and as an advisor of member of uh, European Parliament and the Belgian Federal Minister of Environment. Uh, so Ivo, please tell us your story. Please uh, help us understanding Polis Network a bit more. Thank you. Yes, I hope I can uh, I can help. Um, it's uh, all very complex, of course, what we try to discuss. And uh, in our network, uh, Police Network, a network of uh, about 115 cities and regions, and also an, in that 115, a, a small slice of uh, uh, public research institutes, um, we are um, looking at one aspect, uh, mobility, local mobility processes, but also the interface between uh, the the long distance uh, journey and the city uh, or and the metropolitan area. Uh, a lot is happening in that field, so I, I'll try to touch upon a couple of elements uh, in this presentation, looking at what um, where the uh, urban or the metropolitan mobility transition uh, sits within a bigger uh, transition. Um, how the mobility transition is also uh, multifaceted, um, what a metropolitan response can be, what we see with a focus on, on uh, public space, um, but also how the European Union is, uh, is responding um, as an authority that normally is not dealing too much with, with uh, local issues far away from, uh, from the, the European um, competence, let's say. Uh, and I'll end um, 
to keep you sharp, uh, not with solutions, but with uh, barriers uh, for uh, what we want to do. Um, to, to say that this story will not be easy to, uh, to achieve, that the goals will not be easy to achieve, but that there are many uh, barriers uh, on the way. Um, so a couple of words about uh, our network. We are uh, a network with different kinds of authorities. About uh, 30 of our members, uh, one third of our members are uh, our regions, uh, many of them metropolitan uh, regions. Uh, we have about a third of, um, of members that are smaller and medium-sized cities, um, which have a very different uh, uh, need in view of, of mobility solutions. Um, and we, um, we look at um, innovation. So we engage in, in uh, a lot of European funded research um, where we test technologies in, in, uh, in metropolitan areas and in cities, but also innovations in view of planning, behavioral change, um, et cetera. We are also uh, networking between our members, uh, exchanging and learning together, uh, but also with the goal to translate um, what we uh, see uh, as needs of our members into um, uh, European and global uh, policy. So we are also an advocacy organization. So um, when I started to prepare the presentation, I, I'm, I was reminded uh, of uh, the definition uh, or the starting words of uh, many definitions of mobility um, being uh, mobility is a derived demand or transport is a derived demand. That also means that if there are uh, crises in the world, uh, we see um, derived crises in the or crises in the mobility sector. And uh, I think that's that's something that's that's very important. We hear we heard the previous speakers talk about several issues that that challenges that are faced uh, by metropolitan areas um, and I think we are we are in a situation what you call a perma shock a perma crisis um, the continuity crisis uh, or there are many terms for that but the idea that uh, uh, you can never chill uh, as metropolitan leaders uh, there's always a uh, uh, a bigger crisis looming around the corner and um, the impacts on mobility are, are huge. Eh? So we, we have issues like uh, recently Corona, but also the energy uh, crisis um, with um, uh, coming from, from the, the geopolitical situation of the war in, in Ukraine. Um, so the, um, where each of these crises has an, an, an opportunities that are taken and that have a positive impact on, on metropolitan mobility, um, but also where there are uh, negative uh, impacts we have to, to deal with. Um, the mobility um, issue is set in, in a, a global uh, climate, uh, climate crisis um, to which cities in Europe respond by uh, a very strong ambition to become climate neutral. Um, many of them uh, want to be climate neutral by 2030. Um, there is a program of the commission the, the, or an initiative, uh, the Mission for Climate Neutral and Smart Cities, um, which has um, uh, provoked of, for more than 300 cities uh, the uh, ambition to become uh, climate neutral. Um, and in that group, uh, 112 were selected uh, to be supported uh, for that uh, ambitious mission. Um, so this is a multi-sectoral issue. Eh? So transport is one element in, in, that, uh, in that program. Um, but it, it states that there is a real uh, bottom-up leadership on, uh, this, this, on the climate uh, issue, um, trying to think in a, in a cross-sectoral way uh, to um, to achieve that that goal. Um, another uh, aspect of of, uh, of transition is the um, the appreciation of the uh, of the locality in cities and the metropolitan areas, um, which has translated in the um, in the concept of the fifteen minute city. Uh, recently, also uh, 
part of, or positioned in a culture war on the topic. I let you Google about that and, and read uh, very enlightening or not um, uh, tweets about that topic and uh, very weird uh, appreciations of a very simple planning principle uh, that you need destinations and functions in your uh, neighborhood um, to have a life that is uh, efficient for yourself, that is cost efficient for yourself, um, that can, can uh, increase the quality of life. And that 15 minute city idea, uh, the fact that you that there's some kind of an, an, an uh, reachability and an accessibility of functions within your uh, uh, within a walking distance or an, a short cycling distance uh, has also translated to, to a metropolitan vision um, for for the Paris region, for instance, but also for for other regions in the world. Uh, looking at uh, what you could call the 45-minute uh, city region, uh, looking at, at how easy can I access jobs in, in, an, in a metropolitan area. I think also, for instance, for, for Randstad, uh, the idea that you can reach uh, the, four, um, the four corners of the Randstad uh, by rail uh, within a given uh, time frame, for instance. So that, that's also an, an element of, of organizing uh, in in a in a synchro model in a, thinking of of, uh, of of time as an as a basis to start planning uh, metropolitan access. So when we look at uh, mobility, um, there are many aspects to mobility and many um, objectives we have to serve, and we try to make an, a bit of a breakdown uh, for that in in the slide that you see now. Um, we need to change the vehicles we are using, we, that we call the motor shift, uh, where electrification is an important factor. Um, we will need to change the way we deal with money. Yeah? We need to shift investments. Uh, subsidies need to be changed as well. Um, and also the, the cost for the user is an element in that uh, regard. Um, we need to shift risks. Yeah? So if you look at who is currently suffering from the mobility system in view of pollution, road safety, um, the um, or lack of access and lack of entry into opportunity. Um, these risks are not equally distributed. Um, so uh, mobility poverty is an aspect, but also uh, vulnerability in traffic uh, is an issue. Um, and we will have to change the, the space use um, at a larger scale uh, with land use planning, but also uh, at a micro scale with the last urban meter, for instance, or the, the way we look at, uh, at public space allocation. And that all has, an, uh, in the best case, if we plan these shifts well, uh, the, the, the modes, uh, the balance between the modes in a metropolitan area might also start to, to shift. So what is the kind of policy responses that, uh, that metropolitan uh, areas take? And I will I will omit several ones. I'm, I'm, I'm very clear on that. I will not talk too much about public transport, but I will would like to highlight a couple of um, of, of elements that you might not be uh, not might not be on your radar um, from the start. So I think one very important element is uh, planning. And uh, on the screen you see a couple of uh, of. Uh, targets that have been set by, by cities and, and regions um, in view of, uh, of changing the, the, the metropolitan mobility uh, behavior um, with uh, targets for public transport, uh, reducing car use, um, and uh, really going to active travel as an, uh, a principal mode in, in the daily mobility system. Um, what is important to understand, I think, specifically for, for in the macro regional discussion, is that uh, model, the model shift targets you see here are um, proportional, uh, so they are percentages. Um, this does not say anything about the actual growth of kilometers uh, moved in, an, uh, in a metropolitan area. Um, so in nominal terms, it might be that you actually have more car trips uh, even if you are, uh, if your mode share is better, eh? so this is bringing a lot of challenges to to cities and regions. Um, so we need to think also how we can um, 
how how we deal with the overall growth uh, perspective of um, of mobility in in regions, and this um, this um, model share approach and and the proportional approach might over time not be sufficient as as target setting uh, because mobility tends to to grow. Um, some of the strategies policy response are very concrete going to specific measures for instance clean vehicles uh, a very important transition where also at the european level we are looking at uh, milestones in 2030 2035 when europe will not sell uh, internal combustion engines anymore so all of that has to be prepared upon the oversight and initiative of uh, of decentralized uh, governments to make it possible to also give space to um, the, um, the the infrastructures that support these new mobility uh, either new vehicle systems um, and then my uh, pet topic uh, at police i think one important element uh, of, of planning uh, metropolitan access is not only uh, to look at the uh, provision of services and public transport and building new infrastructure it's also to regulate access and to think at a, at a regional scale about where you want which vehicles at what time of day for which purpose um, and we have seen many um, practices appear also in in an ever bigger scale um, looking at pedestrian central city pedestrian zones uh, but also low emission zones that become quite big that become metropolitan uh, ultra low emission zones over time um, city regions like brussels who think who have an, a regional access uh, policy uh, and also are thinking about um, tolling over time kilometer charging uh, in the future um, so this is a very crucial aspect to to manage um, to manage uh, mobility to avoid congestion um, and to um, to rebalance the, the the modal choice also um, concrete applications can be found for instance in in urban freight delivery or or uh, with schemes in the netherlands uh, for instance looking at uh, at zero emission zones so where you really have uh, quite soon in the, in the next years a, a complete switch to electric uh, for uh, logistic purposes in city centers and that also translates to to an an uh, a question about what i said the last urban meter uh, so the um uh, next to the urban mile the actually place where vehicles stop in the city uh, where they um, let people get out of the uber or move parcels from the van into your house so that question the the management of the curb also becomes quite uh, quite important um and this reflects back also to this to this question that i put forward uh in the uh in the presentation earlier at uh, this idea of of, of uh, uh refocusing from flow uh, from moving people and goods uh, at high capacity um, to change that into an, a consideration of the quality of life, consideration about the actual destination uh, people want to be at. Um, and, and that translates in, in all kinds of, of, of measures also related to public space. And this is an example uh, of, um, of Lisbon, who has a heat plan, um, looking at, uh, at climate change, also redefine, uh, also re repurposing public space to be, to be attractive, but also to be, uh, protective of, of people, uh, by, by finding ways to cool and, and, uh, and, and provide shade, um, to, uh, to pedestrians, to users of the public space. This is a bit of a side note, but it's, it's not an important, um, the public authority has many tools uh, to manage space. I will not go into detail, but but there also is an is an innovation happening. I think we have really very nice practices of of urban densification, in a way that it is not um, uh, increasing uh, car trips um, a lot or car ownership a lot. Um, we also have. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, 
a lot happening on on this uh, managing management of the of the uh, the micro management of space uh, with dynamic uh, curbside management. So it's it's also something that needs to be um, set in inside this um, uh, metropolitan uh, view on on planning mobility. Um, very nice graph uh, from a project called uh, Create, um, who looked actually at how the strategies of local of local and, and regional authorities change over time, uh, in view of of um, yeah curbing or working with vehicles in your city. And uh, we noticed that um, cities are 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 moving out of um, planning for capacity. Um, and planning for movement into an uh, an era of planning for city life, uh, seeing um, yeah having this, this quality of of space um, being attractive also for economic activity for um, for investors uh, based on a, on a high quality of life and high accessibility of urban functions um, as an as a very much very big important objective for um, local planning strategies. Um, so this is something that has been um, supported also by uh, by data. Uh, this graph um, that shows this this uh, this uh, moving out of of peak car um, planning uh, for um, for metropolitan areas. Um, that translates in a planning practice called the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan of the, or the SUMP. Uh, this is an, a planning cycle that has been endorsed by the European Union. It has been tested over the last 15 years uh, and demonstrated, demonstrated its usefulness as an, uh, a, an, a mobility planning process um, in various contexts, in various, um, various corners of, of Europe and beyond. Um, it's an uh, all all guidance about the, the SUMP planning process, as well as uh, detailed documents on on uh, um, city regional planning, uh, are available also from uh, website ltis.org. But I will uh, drop the link uh, later in the chat. Um, but this is a, a super uh, instrument at, that really helps to uh, to create a common understanding between European planners and 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 beyond also about what it is to to manage an, an urban mobility planning process to um, to take the, the same steps have the same kind of, of ways to assess whether a plan is successful um, and whether a process is efficient um, so this is really has been a very helpful tool for uh, for our community and it has uh, yeah i think at the moment there are about um 16 1700 um uh uh, registered SUMPs uh, in in Europe, um, and I'll tell more about that because there's quite some news about the SUMP concept. Um, because the SUMP idea has been taken up in uh, European policy, um, for which I will very briefly on one slide try to explain what what is happening there. Um, I think the the most important uh, um aspect you need to know is is that there is the uh, european green deal and, and uh, a general framework of how the continent wants to move towards uh, uh zero emission uh, greenhouse emission greenhouse gas emission by 2050 um where we want to decouple uh, economic growth from resource use uh, but also want to do that in a, in a way that uh, the system is fair uh, for everyone and no person and no place has is being left behind. Uh, in the framework of the Green Deal, a smart and sustainable mobility strategy is set, and that is then the uh, framework for an urban mobility framework. So that's a European policy document uh, that supports the uh, climate neutrality target, um, but also finds ways to um, to support and, and encourage the member states to work on uh, safe and accessible. Uh, systems and what is important is that uh, the document um, provides a lot of detail of a new approach for uh, the European Union on how um, cities and urban nodes they are called so city regions that are positioned on the trans-European network 
will function in the future to make the trans-European network uh, a success. I put in the title uh, Subsidiarity in Motion because um, this is an, um, a document or an approach that is going very far in reaching out to uh, managing local mobility uh, systems. Um, where in terms of subsidiarity, and I will explain what subsidiarity is, um, in terms of subsidiarity, it is not very uh, clear uh, whether um, the European Union's uh, treaties, uh, so the legal basis of the European Union, actually can um, interfere with local mobility uh, planning. So, and subsidiarity, so I'm yes. I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt. We have to rush a little bit. Okay, because I'll, I'll move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any question okay. time. But okay, yeah. Sorry. So just to say subsidiarity is the way we uh, distribute competences between authorities um, and the principle that it's best to put the most competences on the on the, the authority that is closest to the, the citizen. I, that's a bit the, the idea. So this is a trans-European network. You are, I think you are aware of that. It's a planning concept where the EU puts a strategic uh, program forward of, of creating corridors uh, to move people and goods uh, in an internal market and an open internal market. Um, and what is important for our story are the, the white dots on the map, uh, the definition of uh, 424 urban nodes uh, in uh, the current plan, we are talking about 88 urban nodes and in uh, the next phase, we move to 424 urban nodes. And what is important is that these nodes will have to make a plan and uh, they are, will be obliged to make a sustainable urban mobility plan. Uh, and they will also have to have some intermodal uh, features. So for, um, for passengers as well as goods. Uh, and the idea is also that these nodes become hotspots for alternative fuels, but also for digital mobility innovation, like connected cars, uh, connected vehicles. Um, and this approach provides the first direct legal link between uh, the European Union and, and the local or, or city regional level. Um, so we are close to finalizing the, uh, the negotiations on that uh, dossier. Either European institutions are, are close to concluding, and it, it seems that this this idea of the nodes being uh, being there to to foresee this planning uh, is uh, is needed. So what we want to do there in in the city regions, uh, what we will have to do is to combine all the layers you see on the um, on the slide here. Eh? So this uh, this idea of the 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 corridor entering an an, an metropolitan area. Uh, with with dedicated uh, intermodal infrastructures uh, moving to the level of the actual location where intermodality between the long distance and uh, the last urban mile uh, or kilometer is is uh, actually achieved by in intermodal nodes. Um, so translating into actual uh, spaces in the city that are designed to make this uh, this happen. And you see cities like Eindhoven who have strategies like that, um, not going into too much details, but where they allocate per city, um, yeah, per, uh, per uh, scale, a focus on a specific mode uh, with, the, um, with the, 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 the policy measures that come with that choice. Um, uh, coming with that in the in the plan, and so the pedestrian for the neighborhood, uh, to the uh, more motorized uh, user for the, um, the 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 city regional access. So just a couple of words uh, on the barriers for change. Um, I think it's it's important to understand that we will be confronted with vehicles in our streets that are not adapted for urban uh, or city regional use um, putting this this uh, beauty as an example of what we uh, find problematic in in uh, in city streets um, so this is a continuous struggle we try to to fight um, 
multi-layered governance is an, is complex to manage, and and you have heard examples of that uh, in 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 previous uh, courses. But the idea that uh, there are uh, many uh, governments that need to interact and uh, have a combined um, combined impactful um, way of working together is not uh, is not easy to achieve and that also translates in in uh, planning processes and this is an example from the uk it's it's a bit of an older example but uh, you find in red a local transport plan um, so what we call an nsump in the uk um, and surrounding the sump uh, you find all the uh, institutional stakeholders, the laws that apply, as well as the planning documents that are in place. Um, so it's that kind of, um, of checkerboard we will have to navigate uh, if, we want to, um, <laughs> if we want to plan uh, for metropolitan uh, mobility um, in the future. Knowledge is an important aspect. Uh, I will not go into detail, but there's an, uh, a big difference between what public authorities have in, in terms of capacity of understanding digital processes and innovation and what the private sector can deliver at the moment. Um, and um, another issue is also the, um, the growing uh, aspect of what we call uncompromisification and compromisification, not a real world word, but uh, a real issue. Um, so the idea that uh, it's difficult to, to come to um, political compromises, to come to societal agreement on certain measures, um, and that's a growing concern. And that's my last slide is also that we, we need leadership, um, local leadership, but also leadership at the level of, um, of planning that have been mentioned by the previous speakers. Um, so the, 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 the city regional level, um, the, the macro regional level, uh, where you still need to find uh, mechanisms for uh, democratic uh, legitimacy of measures, uh, where you need uh, people who can embody a project and can take forward um, uh, these complex uh, planning processes and uh, complex packages of, uh, of measures to, um, to make mobility in, in a region uh, better. So, to end, I want to invite you also to our uh, annual conference in Leuven at uh, end of the year. Uh, so if you want to continue that discussion, we are uh, happy to, to meet you there. Sorry yeah, that I spoke too long, but it's also quite a complex uh, topic. I will stop, uh, stop talking. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Ivo. This was, uh, I completely agree. This is a very difficult topic. And also we are constantly talking about different scales that makes it even more complex. Mm. Uh, but you actually went through all the skills, which mm -hmm. is really important mm. for the students to learn. Quickly, we pick up one question, which is in the chat box. If there are more questions, um, please start adding in the chat box and we pick it up after the next uh, uh, presentation. But uh, Eva, would you like to react on this question? Uh, what could be the role of participative approaches for sustainable urban mobility? Yeah. How can it's a, yeah. influence? It's, it's very important. And it's also, um, and there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of practices uh, around that. Um, I think the um, what there are two aspects that I want to highlight. The idea that uh, you need, need to set um, boundaries for such a process. Um, uh, to give an example, we, we have um, an experiences where, where, for instance, the boundary can be for, for this district where we start a consultative process, the, um, the, there will be a zone 30. So the idea is to reduce speed and the, the government, the local government has made the decision this will be a zone 30. Um, so there is no discussion about that, but the neighborhood or the district can discuss um, discuss within these boundaries. Same for climate neutrality, for instance. Um, once that marker has been set, the consultative process can be set within that, that boundary yeah? so that you talk from the perspective that uh, measures will, will lead to an, an, a climate neutral mobility system. Second element uh, related also to the scales that have been mentioned. Yeah? So how do you organize uh, consultative processes at a, at a macro regional scale that, that still um, have an, um, 
have an, an a legitimacy, have an understanding from the users also, have an, an impact, uh, have a relation with, with local processes. So this is this is I think a very uh, very complex <laughs> complex issue. Eh? So how do you um, bring scale to an uh, to I, how, how do you introduce these elements of scales in, in that process? Thank you so much, okay. Ivo. Um, you also, so uh, for um, all the students, this was a more content related uh, presentation. So this was one of the themes that we are dealing with. Uh, so you could see that how we go from local scale to uh, mega region scale. Uh, Ivo mentioned about the 15 minute city and 45 minutes region. I would also like to add two hours mega region, which is mm. has been a study. And that's something really covers then with all three scales that we have been talking mm -mm -mm. about. I'll put the link in the chat box for everyone to look into the studies. Meanwhile, Kirsten Nablik is our next keynote speaker. Uh, welcome, Kirsten. He's a senior um, expert for open development and research by design in at the PBL. PBL is the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. And he's the project leader of PBL Regional Atlas and uh, works with coordination of visual design and maps and scenario studies from PBL. Today, he is invited here to tell us more the process, the method of thinking towards scenarios, how we can make that as a use that as a tool uh, so this is a bit more process that we're getting into. So for the students, please start asking more questions for him already so that we can pick it up as soon as Kirsten is done. Kirsten, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, nice to be here. Nice uh, to see this in international initiative. Um, I think it's a very good initiative and also I feel very comfortable. Uh, I, myself, I have an international background. I've been living in different cities. And nice to see all the different names uh, of the participants. Pretty we, can, we cannot see the faces, but maybe tomorrow in the presentations I will see more of the, of the, of the faces of the people. Um, so I will start to share my presentation. I hope this works. It works. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. you yeah. see the good presentation. Yeah. Uh, um, you can yes. maybe do the full screen because now we see the PowerPoint. Yes, better. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. It's always uh, interesting to see uh, how this works. Um, today, I want to sh uh, share our experiences with working uh, with. Um, with scenarios, we recently published a scenario study we've been working on uh, with a big team and also uh, um, um, we've been working about two years on this project. There's a lot to tell, so um, uh, also uh, yeah, a lot of information, but I'll try to keep it compact and uh, Alan Krita, you can also stop me uh, if it gets too long, so we have some time for questions. Um, I guess you're familiar with, with uh, scenario thinking. It's, it's about uh, creating and, and, and discussing different options for the, for the future. So it's always about, yeah, different, uh, comparing uh, different possible pathways uh, um, to the future. And uh, yeah, as planners and designers, we, we can have an important role in, in this, uh, not only because we can create images, and it's also important because the future is not there yet. So we have to, uh, create images and that's an important role we can play as, as uh, designers in there uh, but also um, in my experience designers and plans are very good also in in switching in between disciplines uh, yeah the transboundary already mentioned uh, transboundary thinking the, the multidisciplinary uh, thinking so we can also play a role in in, in connecting different uh, uh, disciplines if we work with with policy makers and, and researchers um, uh, so that's also I want to uh, yeah uh, point out, and uh, I'm also really starting with my main message I want to give you. So if uh, if uh, presentation uh, if I don't get to to uh, present the full presentation, then uh, you already have this uh, point. Because the main point is that um, scenarios they're not really um, meant as a prediction of the future. It's, it's not plans for the future, but uh, 
they are much more a tool for discussions and workshops. So uh, if we show different uh, options, different images, different maps of the future, it helps very much um, for, for uh, yeah, policymakers and, and planners to broaden the horizon. So to, to come up with, uh, uh, with new ideas, with uh, innovative ideas. Huh? So it's, it's really sort of a trigger, uh, think out of the box uh, to, to, to um, yeah, expand the horizon. Um, yeah, a little bit about uh, PBL, Plan Bureau für Lefonghaving, uh, the English name in Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. Um, we are a scientific research institute which mainly gives policy advice um, to the ministries. Uh, and we work in the fields of environment, energy, nature, and spatial planning. So we also, we have, we have about 300 people divided in six. Uh, departments and it also makes it very exciting and uh, all this uh, expertise and knowledge in in this uh, institute and yeah i'm, I'm uh, working in the department of spatial planning of course in space all the different teams they um they have to be integrated and they come together uh just to show us different types of uh, studies we do uh, like thematic uh, research we also recently uh, published a study on the on a comparison of the Yangtze and the River Rhine uh, river basins. So it might be interesting for you to, to have a look uh, at that. I already put the the web link also in the in the chat. Um, we also do uh, the monitoring of of the current um, environmental and spatial uh, policy. Um, we're not really a data. We don't produce so much data, but we uh, sometimes we think uh, we, we uh, it's important to to um, um, yeah to develop new data sets or combine data sets. Um, we also work on that, um, and um, we have a lot of classical um, scientific reports. But we also try to work a lot with uh, infographics and visual uh, design to uh, communicate our um, yeah knowledge and our um, sort of the outcomes of our research. And uh, Alan Kitty also already mentioned the, the Atlas, so the regional Atlas. Um, it's an interactive web tool where a lot of maps are accessible. And yeah, the nice thing you can zoom in and out and um, you can combine different uh, kind of maps. Uh, so I think it's a nice uh, tool to, to dive into. And it's an interesting tool if you work with, um, yeah, with, with region or, or specific sites uh, to to get a first impression what's what's going on in the site and what's what's the status quo um so it can be you can very easily make a, a quick scan of of a, of a site and also uh, zooming in and out at different scales um also gis modeling to to um yeah to to predict um give a picture of future developments uh, and to do that in, in a sort of uh, more quantitative way and and future uh, yeah projects which which look into the future this is a project published uh, about five years ago and uh, so this is the next step uh, where we went on with the scenarios the course scenarios for the Netherlands in 2050. Um, so this this book we published uh, 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 two months ago, and there's also a theme a website which you can look at. Um, yeah, there's a lot of attention we, we know, and there's sort of a lot of um, at all levels, provinces, uh, municipalities, at the national level, people are working on um, good plans for the future. Uh, how can we move on towards a sustainable society? Um, which is yeah, exciting times. It's also a big urgency. It's a, a lot needs to be done. Um, a lot is happening. And yeah, we are not the first one to do to this. There's a kind of tradition in the Netherlands to, to work with uh, scenarios, uh, to look at the spatial um, development. Um, actually, it's interesting to see the, the first study about uh, what is it, 30, 40 years ago. It was an initiative by designers who were not so, so happy with uh, the spatial development and wanted to produce more more creative ideas and basically it's it's uh, the question is uh, what kind of future do we want it's not a, a technical question but it's much more a, a societal question um, um, to think about what kind of living environment uh, we want and in our study we look at the horizon of, of 2050 
Um, that's also because there are very concrete uh, ambitions and, and aims for that. Um, yeah, uh, Green Deal was already mentioned, but also Netherlands is striving to become a climate neutral and a circular society in 2050. And so the main research questions of our study is how, how can the Netherlands uh, look uh, like in, in 2050? Uh, when it yeah, will be uh, climate neutral and circular and future proof. And there's not, not one way to go, there are different pathways. Uh, so which are the pathways, uh, how can policy uh, make us work to that towards that future? And our policy uh, um, context is sort of the national uh, strategy for, for spatial and environmental um, development. And also it's it's a way it, it, it inspires or it forces people also to think uh, about the long term, huh? because also we know that politics, they are very busy with both the decisions they have to make today and tomorrow. But uh, the scenario is also always a way to, to, to take people further 20 years, uh, 30 years ahead. And if we think about the, the challenges concerning like for example, the energy transition, huh? these are topics you cannot solve in, 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 in a couple of years, but it really needs, uh, needs long-term perspectives. So in, in the first uh, part of the study, we, we actually looked, so what's, what's the state uh, of development and um, uh, what's, yeah, what's, what's going on? Huh? And, and, and it's in the first part, we already uh, also pointed out uh, that we cannot go on the way we are working in the moment because it puts too much uh, pressure on, on the environment. Um, also, there are social challenges, but the way we, we build our cities and mobility, it, it's really putting too much uh, pressure on, on the ecological system and on the climate. Um, yeah, we also looked at the governance structures. There's also a problem huh, that, that the financing is, is very, very separated per ministry. Uh, so we also advise that this had to be sort of integrated better. And in the Netherlands, uh, uh, the policy is very good in combining um, sort of the housing, working infrastructure. But we believe it's, it's, it has to be even it has to has to integrate also the nature, water um, uh, challenges better, and also include more participants in the in the discussions. And in in that sense. Um, yeah, the scenarios, if we put the scenarios on the table, um, it can help as a, as a tool for, for this discussion. Um, so the four scenarios, yeah, I, I don't think, I don't really have time to, to go into detail, but the different images, we produce different uh, kinds of, of maps um, per scenario. And what I also want to yeah, share with you that the way we, um, it was a very mixed method approach. So we, we combined different uh, disciplines. Uh, um, we combined qualitative and quantitative research. Um, we uh, worked together with, with experts from economy, um, social sciences, geography. And, but the basis, what's really, um, yeah, and we, we looked sort of a different, it's not only on urban development, but also in relation with uh, the natural uh, development, climate adaptation, energy transition so a very yeah integrated in, in very different uh, topics but um, to develop the scenarios it was important to think what kind of societies um, are thinkable uh, for the future so what we used was this mixing uh, uh, panel of governmental and societal um, values and yeah with discussions and, and some research we we developed four different sets of societies, let's say societies of, of the future. You could also, yeah, connect these uh, different sets to political trends or different uh, political uh, parties, which we see in the, in the, in the uh, society now. And of course, uh, yeah, society is always a mix of, of the different uh, uh, groups, but it helps sort of to, to point out uh, for different uh, trends or directions. So with, with the societal sets, uh, we, we start to think how would that, which decisions, which uh, spatial effects uh, could be thinkable. And at the early stage already also uh, started uh, doing some, some sketches on, on, on maps. 
and uh, organized a lot of uh, ateliers on national level, but also on on the regional level to to have this interaction and to make it more uh, a collaborative um, um, a process. And finally, uh, also developing a very detailed map, um, which can be also used for the regions huh? because we know sort of the challenges um, solutions have to found within the urban regions and also now the the ministry of spatial planning is asking the regions and the provinces um, to to come up um, with proposals uh, how to create a, a sort of a, a pathways to for, towards sustainable uh, future and uh, we also work with different uh, scales we we Used more conceptual maps to to um, because the yeah we saw the, the the detailed maps are very detailed so so some people have problems to to interpret them so th these are more for policymakers to see the main characteristics uh, per map um, in the detailed maps we we lay out the different uh, themes on top of each other so you see how how the map um, is is produced and. In the website, I also put the link in the chat. Uh, you, we have a, a, a map viewer where you can also look at the different layers separately. So you can compare the scenarios, but you can also compare the, the different layers also as a tool to, to discuss, uh, discuss the different options. And of course, it's a pity we only have this for the Netherlands. It would be nice to, to do this also for the neighboring countries, but uh, we understand that probably that uh, we only have a Data and also as a, as a PBL, we don't really uh, we cannot we don't end up in a position to make proposals for our neighboring countries. But we also looked into regions. We we worked together with stakeholders in in regions um, to also test the scenarios in on a regional scale. And also together with uh, uh, design offices, uh, uh, developed more local uh, settings how the. Um, yeah, what what the scenarios would mean on, on a local scale, which is very important, of course, for people to imagine um, uh, what kind of futures uh, are uh, thinkable. So yeah, all, all this uh, visual uh, material and also the main storylines are on the on the website. And just one example of about the power of moving between scales. Uh, because one of the topics was the circular economy, and here we work together with also a different uh, design office, BVR, to think from yeah how what kind of system uh, uh, would the circular economy be, and how would the, the economic hubs work in this scenario? And already you see on the top, how we were already like moving between uh, different scales, and from this thinking, we we you know, positioned later the the positions of the hubs on on the national map. But also translated that um, onto the local scale. So uh, you see, it's sort of really uh, sort of moving uh, between scale. It's not not so much upscaling or down, but it's really sort of continuously, uh, uh, yeah, actually more in a parallel sense, uh, uh, working working on the different scales at the same time. So this for for another scenario, um, not really. Yeah, this in the regional scenario, this the hubs would be much more local and, and regional. Uh, looking at, at refurbishment and, and recycling and reuse. Um, so I will finish. Um, um, yeah, I hope, yeah, that's it. Uh, you can see uh, we, we, with the scenarios, uh, we can increase the awareness of the uncertainties to, to, to deal with the uncertainties. And yeah, we can strengthen the involvement of thinking about the, the futures. Um, and as, as planners and designers, we, we can play an interesting role. I think it's, I think you cannot do this scenario studies without the uh, designers and, and planners. Uh, if, if, um, if if you really uh, want to, yeah, to to do it in, in this integrated way. Um, so at what's happening at the moment? Uh, policymakers they are already uh, at different uh, levels of municipalities, of uh, provinces. Uh, they are already um, some some are already sort of using the scenarios, and also with the project group we reserved some time to support this. Huh? So so, um, for instance, or municipalities can ask us uh, for presentations and and to workshops. 
course, we know it's also not yeah, it's also not super easy to use them to, in the discussion. To, to so it needs some um, um, accompanying. And yeah, in a nutshell, that's my presentation. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Um, it's a really good understanding of the scenario as a tool. And uh, I hope that the students can pick up, use this more. The, uh, the, the links are already there. I was wondering if you could also share the presentation, then we can maybe put that as a reference for them because the images uh, the scenario of the uh, the images of the scenarios that you have shown that could also be a very good example for them to understand how to illustrate through maps and through different images. But uh, you can see sure. that's that possible. I can send perfect. you. That's perfect. Uh, any questions? Maybe now I open the floor. Unfortunately, Evo had to leave uh, our on the speaker, but. Is there any question from the students before we take a break and then start into the get into the workshop? I have all the speakers here who are who gave you an overview today morning. So students, please raise their hands and come up with some questions. Uh, there was one question in the chat box. I already picked that up while others come up. How do how do you think uh, innovative ideas generated in initiatives like Next Generation Podium, along with professional expertise, can reach the political support for implementations? So, anybody, maybe Dagmar, would you like to answer this? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? I yes. Paul, maybe this is for you as well. Uh, both of you can answer. How do you think the innovative ideas which are being generated in such podiums like Next Generation um, during the professional expertise can reach uh, and support the uh, reach and have the political support for implementation? So, how can we really implement these ideas? Okay, yeah. Um, well, as, as cities and governments, of course, we always talk with our politicians. So there is always an informal way that whatever we do, we actually talk and tell that to people. So this is definitely already in the first examination. Whether this will become part of policy, this is a long process. Uh, policies don't change from one day to the other. It needs a lot of research, good argumentation, a lot of a discussion between different stakeholders. So you will not see the results tomorrow, but maybe on the long term. Thank you, Dagmar. Paul? Yeah, yeah I can add to that. Uh, I think um, there are, particularly in this context of the next generation podium, there are two ways of doing it, I feel. And that is one is very much um, addressing these um, people in political power and addressing them with ideas that are really formulated in such a way or shown in such a way or um, have, have, have images connected to them, have designs or um, examples uh, put next to them that really can um, change the feeling of these people. And I think that is very well possible. Eh? So we should not exclude that they are not unreachable, like uh, Dagmar said, these, these are reachable in an informal way, but make sure that your message gets across clearly, uh, with also using the wording, yeah? trying to find ways of uh, engaging them in such a way that they can understand it in a couple of minutes. And the second way, I think we should not exclude that, uh, which is very important, has been mentioned already a couple of times, is engage with the public, uh, engage with the communities that are really being part of the discussion and being at the moment quite often left out. And um, I think we always underestimate the power of that uh, kind of uh, involvement of uh, working with, uh, uh, well, with your neighbors, for instance, or uh, with your direct surroundings, because it's has shown time and again that actually these kind of movements can grow and can find each other and, uh, and, and together become a political reality. So yeah, that, that will be my advice. Great, thank you, Paul.
First, and there's a question for you, do the scenarios sufficiently cover all the trends in the society or how did you arrive to this number of four as clear different scenarios? Or maybe there are more possibilities. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, actually, that's a good, good question. Um, no, I think you can easily imagine more, more, more combinations. Um, but we limited it to four because it's it gets too complex. We, we noticed if you come up with uh, seven different uh, uh, scenario uh, societal trends, it's it gets so in the communication. Um, yeah. It gets too much. Um, and and we've been working with with these four sets already since a longer time. It's actually not uh, yes, it was already like if the the last scenario set, which was five years ago, and and so far it seems to work with it. <laughs> so um, so far it yeah, it seems to be a, a good set. Yeah, it's also something you. we didn't we didn't really know in advance. It was sort of also learning by doing and and, and trying and um, but uh, yeah, for our of uh, purpose to use them as a tool it, it seems to to work yeah yeah so maybe the the advice for everyone is to see this as a tool as a method to constantly keep creating new scenarios so what kirsten also showed the tool as a method so you really can use the layers or understand how they are considering different layers in different scenarios and use that method to build your own scenario and not be restricted to just four um Another question, uh, is the decoupling of uh, economic growth, um, oh, oh, sorry, all the questions are coming in together. Maybe maybe the students can come forward. Uh, Rami Shaya, do you want to come to the screen rather than me? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, OK. Uh, my question is whether the decoupling of um, economic growth from the resource use, as was um, said in uh, one of the presentation, is it feasible and sufficient in preventing reaching irreversible levels of climate change? Uh, and this is what uh, like uh, the European uh, Green Deal is uh, suggesting. And what do you think uh, of ideas rethinking the need for constant economic growth? Thank you. Anyone? Yeah, well, good question. Is it sufficient decoupling? Um, well, of course, we know huh? we, we we cannot turn back time, so we already built up a big negative impact. So, um, um, yeah, even if we manage to decouple, <laughs> so uh, temperatures will still be rising. Mm. But then it makes makes the urgency. Yeah, it's 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 obvious. Huh? We really have to find a way of of decoupling and um, maybe if I can add yeah because of our scenarios only actually one is really um, the the green scenario is actually the only one which is so where the economy is, is is actually shrinking it's actually a degrowth um, scenario whereas um, the other ones are still growing but find ways to yeah to 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 build a lot of uh, power wind parks uh, somehow to compensate um, and we actually we, we got a lot of reactions to that green uh, scenario very positive but also very negative reactions so we, we from the, of the 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 green degrowth society they were embracing it fantastic and, and finally there's somebody who makes a degrowth scenario um but on the same time more from the sort of right wing uh, communities we, we also got very critical because it's yeah it, it limits limits the 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 the, um, the flexibility of the the freedom of people to make all the choices they want to make because there's a kind of a, every person has a planetary budget in that scenario um it's yeah that's also what we know it is very uh, polarized question and, and that's also a big challenge in in, in in the decoupling that we we actually know what what technically would be the right way and would be maybe design wise the right way um but to um, yeah, to take along all groups of society, that's a very big challenge. Yeah, I think that also goes quite nicely in line with the next question, which was raised. Um, yeah, Carly. Yeah, Carly. Uh, 
Hi, everyone. Yeah, sorry, I can't turn on my camera now, but uh, let me just ask the question. So my question was that in talking about engaging the public in design or research process, how do you ensure that the public needs are actually met at the implementation stage, especially if it conflicts with those of major private shareholders? Good question. Dagmar, do you have an answer? Yeah, that's always, and now we're coming a little bit in that, uh, that thing that uh, since cities, we, and this is not politics, the data region here and that is not politics, we cannot really go to, to cities because then they get confused, right? So that's why we need students and NGOs and research institutes to talk with them because they, they have an open discussion, but when a city talks with uh, citizens, I mean, you all probably live in a city and uh, everybody is irritated about something with the city, maybe the garbage has not been collected. Um, so that's always a different situation. So I think it's uh, that's exactly why we have this meeting now. Uh, but can I ask a, a follow-up question? So for example, could it be an idea that perhaps maybe designers should also be involved in politics then? Because for example, there are some uh, presidents who are maybe former, uh, I don't know, artists or things like that. And when they get into, for example, there was this Albanian president who was an artist before and coming into power and having all that uh, authority to command uh, change, I think the, his actions were more kind of sensitive to where he was coming from. So maybe is it an idea that perhaps then designers should be involved in politics? Because also there was a colleague of mine that was telling me about the governance in India where they have ministries, but they also have something called a secretary. And I don't know if Alan Peter, you can confirm this for me, but usually the secretary is a, someone that is an expert in the field and the minister kind of listens to the 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 proposals given by the secretary. So it's like in the end, the secretary has the not absolute power, but let's say the the higher power in in deciding, let's say what the project will be and stuff like that. So I don't know if maybe in the Netherlands there's something like that as well that can perhaps. That's very true, and if I'm not wrong, that's also there in Brussels because they also have these thematic secretaries who are helping the minister to make decisions. But I'm uh, maybe Paul, you can say something if we have that in our ministries. On well, that. I can say quite a lot about that that I want, but uh, <laughs> I think in the Netherlands this is a serious problem. So. Um, um, having the right kind of knowledge uh, accessible to our politicians directly is, is quite a big challenge. I think uh, PBL is actually doing quite a good job in that sense, also being very much nested uh, in, and giving policy advice quite directly. It's also being noted. So it's not only seen with the people who are making the policies themselves, but also politically seen. But this is a... Um, this is a big challenge in the Netherlands, uh, since actually we've decided uh, somewhere a couple of decades ago that it would be actually good to have um, uh, have the people who advise um, uh, the, the ministers uh, to have them not be uh, connected to any knowledge base. Huh? So that it should be managerial people instead of knowledge knowledgeable people. And this is a real, real problem uh, at the moment we, we see. So I think there's a change in that. You also feel a change in that. There's new people coming in. Um, they've also, also decided that this can not continue, but this at the moment, particularly at the national level, this is a big issue. Dagmar, you want to object to that vision? Uh, I, I think uh, I think you are here talking about it a little bit, maybe the national government. Yes. Um, because at local level, of course, our director sits every week together with, uh, with, a, with a politician on the table and she is uh, an open plan out yeah. and they talk. So it's always a little bit of different. There is a big difference between uh, the national level and the local level in that respect. In, in the Netherlands, yeah. yeah, but it is nice to have a formalized position that gives, makes so things fun. a little bit more transparent.
Yes. Thank but you I would speak. also say there's we're also living in the age of activism, and I think we need that. Um, yeah, so I, I would also say we really should uh, engage as uh, as designers, as, as thinkers, as uh, as scientists in this uh, movement of uh, of activism. Yeah. And um, it's really a very good inspiration, Carlin, what you mentioned, that should designers not be a part of politics. Uh, we have been working with uh, Rights University Groningen about this, that how spatial planners and designers can span their boundary of work and refocus. So I have put an article there for you in the chat box so you can have okay, it. Thank you. Uh, last question from Kiran, and then we take a break. Uh, you're muted, yes. <laughs> um, hi, I was just wondering about um, you know, the presentations um, and also in sustainability discussions in general, a lot is mentioned around data collection and smart cities um, and having that as a way to achieve sustainability. Um, however, that's not always possible. Like we talked about complexity, it's not possible to have all the data. And it's also not always desirable. Um, like there was a smart city project in Toronto, Canada that uh, was rejected by the citizens because it would have just been over surveillance in a lot of ways. And we know that certain um, marginalized communities tend to be over surveilled. Um, so, you know, not contributing contributing to that on uh, sustainability when we're trying to achieve sustainability is important. So I was wondering um, if anyone has thoughts on how do we achieve sustainability within this context of um, data collection and the both the ability and the pros and cons to it. Thank you. Thank you. Kirsten first. Yes, maybe I, uh, I think you already gave part of the answer, <laughs> being, being critical and saying that it's, it's not the only uh, thing we need. Um, but it's an important basis, but you have to be smart about it. Huh? You, know, you have to sort of, uh, work in, 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 a, in a smart and, and good way. Um, because also I observe that there's a lot of um, also nice design visions about the future, which are very creative, but not um, um, they don't use any data. And then it's also hard for, for uh, especially then for not designers or policymakers to to evaluate, uh, they, then they think, oh yeah, nice vision, but we are, what is this based on? Uh, what's, uh, what's the substance of this? And then, um, so I think to, to come up with good proposals and to con convincing proposals, you really, you, you need a, a, at least a certain good basis of data, but, but use it in a, in a good way. And in that way, you find a, a balance huh, to, and, and then especially thinking about the future, we don't have the data of the future. So um, um, you, you sort of, uh, um, yeah, have to sort of come up with creative ways to to find a good balance. And of course, I think there's a, there's a big role for uh, for public authority in this, and that is the, the, the big difference in the in the Toronto case was also quite a lot of uh, private companies involved in that who uh, use that data for other purposes. I I know there's a big role. In the Netherlands, about um, the data of uh, um, mobility, which actually Google says they can deliver, and uh, why would uh, the Dutch government bother with uh, creating a data of its own to be publicly available for everyone to use? Uh, but that requires oversight because, of course, um, the trust in governments is maybe even less than in Google uh, somehow. Um, so it requires a quite uh, a clear structure of oversight. And next, I also think there's a big role for um, for community data collection. Uh, I think uh, the Waag Society has done quite a, a lot of interesting work on that uh, in Amsterdam, and they are really uh, trying to build networks of uh, communities that create their own data, uh, collect it, monitoring, and, and create data, which is really of high quality that you can use in terms of uh, usability for um, important vision making, uh, but it is not owned by uh, either private companies or, 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 or government. Yeah, maybe I would like to add one thing. Um, 
With the Euro Delta, we don't have hardly have any data available. And that is exactly the weakness of this, uh, our discussion, because when we talk about it, everybody says, where's the boundary? Where does it start? Are you sure this is really uh, a different, an area that is interconnected? When I go to my economic department, I ask them, where do the businesses of Amsterdam do their work? They don't know. People don't know right now. Maybe this is information on the national level, but right now we haven't talked with them yet. But we, at, at least, we don't know this. So, they, so you kind of need this data also to show your own politician, uh, to give him an evidence why it is important that he should work on it to show this relation, because of course, everybody expects to become a local politician to solve a local problem. And that may be cooperation, you need cross-border cooperation to solve the local problem. You need to show somehow some kind of evidence. What we did, we did uh, maybe, uh, Paul mentioned it earlier briefly, we did a research which was uh, done by an uh, consor international consortium and they calculated what would be the effect if we would implement a couple of measures like not flying below 500 kilometers using trains uh, and a couple of other measures. What would be the, the effect if you would implement them on the scale of the Euro Delta? And the result was that this would affect in 2% CO2 reduction of all Euro on the yearly base. So this is such an amount, so much effect you could reach and this is proven by the data that we even was uh, we even spoke with Franz Timmermans about this. So you come with data, you come to the top, basically, if it has effect, because that's something they also need. They look for liable information. Thank you so much, Dagmar. Uh, I think uh, we are very late, so I would uh, say suggest to close the conversation right now for the opening ceremony, but for the students, all the uh, speakers will be meeting you over the last next two days, today, afternoon, tomorrow, so ask more questions during these discussions. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today, particularly for the opening ceremony. We take a five minutes break and then we get back for the workshop. Uh, that is meant for the students and the young professionals and the experts can uh, leave us for now and come back tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock for the final pitches. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we join back in five to ten minutes. See you.